I will briefly speak about the Office of Strategic Service, in short, or better known as the OSS, in the following minutes. I'll look at so-called civil affairs handbooks, and the backdrop against which I will do so is the Allied occupation of, of Italy, and for the most part, I shall add, southern Italy. What should emanate from this is how the OSS shaped perceptions of, of both Italy and Italians and consequentially affected the attitudes and actions of the personal planning and implementing the occupation on site. As such, it conditioned how allies or how allied, and, and I shall already mention here that I understand allies here as, as only British and US Americans as those two main allies fighting in Italy. So it conditioned how allied officers would face the Italian society under occupation, and despite all the vital information the handbooks provided, paved the way for, for all kinds of misunderstandings. I will move forward in a threefold step, which, which you can see here. At first, I briefly go about the handbooks and how the OSS was involved in the drafting. Um, in the second part of my talk, I will present some of the handbook's contents by way of example and elaborate upon how it subscribed to image and imaginations of, of Italy and Italians. And to conclude, I will briefly analyze to what extent the handbooks or rather their contents found entry into the planning of the occupation and affected its very practices on the local scene. Two diverse types of handbooks existed. For one, there were there were handbooks providing information on the Italian regions, so-called zone handbooks. A first part, they introduced people and administration. A second presented the economic conditions. And the third part offered local information and a who's who of citizens. These handbooks were largely produced by the British Ministry of Econ uh, Economic Warfare or the Foreign Office. The OSS was chiefly responsible for a second type of handbook. In total, 16 of those handbooks existed for Italy, exploring specific topical issues which were identified to be relevant for the occupation. And the OSS prepared 12 of them, as you can see here. So I have marked those prepared by the OSS in italics. And later on, I'll, I'll give you some examples from the first handbook on, on the geographical and social background. The handbooks were usually prepared for the military government division of the office of the provost um, marshal general. Um, this very provo uh, provost marshal general had instituted in mid 1942 a military government training program that should prepare future civil affairs officers for the task of administering occupied territories. And I've given you two, two pictures here from this military government program, which basically taught yeah, prospective officers how to administer occupied territory. The handbooks hence serve various needs. They should assist civil affairs officers charged with policy making and planning, be reference type of books for the use of civil affairs officers and training, and above all, make certain that organized data is in hand whenever events require it. It was this last point that technically assigned a crucial relevance to the handbooks. Vital information was tough to come by, and this marked the core objective connected with the issuance of said handbooks. The need was especially great, since Italy appeared like a mystery, as some scholars have called it, to vast strata of US Americans, and many of the circulating information, for instance, about import statistics, caloric intake, or, or stocks of food, came from official fascist sources and was most certainly, if not outright fabricated or at least sugarcoated. Three things were in further mention in, regarding this information policy. First of all, to catch up with the negligent state of information on the Italian war enemy, the, USS, uh, the OSS was out um, to prove itself. This does not mean to, to, to speak of, of some sort of litmus test for the intelligence agency, Yet, the OSS could successfully vindicate its institutional role by providing solid information from reliable sources. Two further aspects hampered these efforts, though. On the one hand, little lead time was available. The OSS only saw its establishment a year before the invasion of Sicily would mark the beginning of the Italian campaign. 
In fact, its inception, growing out of the Office of the Coordinator of Information in June 1942, testified to the crucial relevance of intelligence gathering and of obtaining, processing, and evaluating information. More than infamous espionage activities, which made a lasting impact on the OSS cultural image of adventurists operating under conditions of mortal peril, an impression, uh, an impression largely substantiated by memorial literature, it was this information processing that marked the biggest and earliest contribution of the OSS as far as the invasion and occupation of Italy are concerned. Connecting to the little time between the establishment of the OSS and the point at which plans for the occupation of Italy were approved, the issue of coming up with a working infrastructure and trusted, well-established sources loomed large. The research and analysis branch, which would later on achieve acclaim for their in-depth analysis of conditions in Nazi Germany and profound reports written with an eye towards the post-war, was still in its infancy and far removed from being the professionalized and, and renowned staff encompassing some 900 historians, economists, psychologists, anthropologists, political scientists, and, and others to, to just name the most important academic disciplines. A sophisticated level of reports characteristic, for instance, for, for some scholars of the Frankfurt School working for the OSS was not readily available. No to German political uh, scientist Franz Neumann, just to give you an example, was among the very first emigre scholars when he took up work for the OSS in February 1943. By then, though, the occupation of Sicily was only a mere five months away, so that the information provided by the handbooks for Italy could only assume the character of a factual reference book in the best case scenario. Given the lack of time, the rushed formation of the intelligence sphere and little expert, let alone first-hand knowledge about Italy, it perhaps comes as little surprise that many stereotypes pervaded the books produced by the OSS. Though I should mention also that this it, it wasn't unique to the OSS handbooks. To illustrate this point, I focus on the handbook on the geographic and social background. So you, you can see here the, the table of contents of the roughly 50 pages of the handbook. Well, it may already read disturbingly that the description about the racial divisions found on the Italian peninsula distinguished between physiognomic types in the Po Basin and the Mediterranean Southern type. So what I marked here in, in yellow, the passages about the ascribed character traits seem even more telling. Under the heading personal characteristics, wild generalizations found entry into the handbook prepared by the OSS. Little to no agency was conced uh, conceded to the Italians when it was nonchalantly stated that a philosophical resignation to the inevitability of life's problems characterizes the Italians as a whole and is a form of mental laziness. Even more damning a social structural argument was inscribed in this devastating assessment is the cosmopolitan attitude of the upper class is sharply contrasted to the childlike qualities of the lower classes. Lines of social distinctions are closely drawn and there is generally no real ambition among the lower classes to rise above themselves. How allied civil affairs officers should make use of this alleged factual information also emanates from this paragraph. In intercourse with the natives, and particularly the humbler classes, much better results can be achieved by a patient, smiling, courteous, and good humored attitude than by any other means. It's perhaps not a stretch to draw a direct line to the missionizing efforts characterizing some of the Allied officers' work in Italy in their quest to modernize the country and the society, obviously under decisively US American auspices and also what is more to guide the humble Italians on their path towards knowledge, democracy, and modernity. U.S. historian Andrew Buchanan has already shown light on the Allied crest to teach Italians. The cartoon bears testimony to these efforts. The AMGARD, so the Allied military government of occupied territories back, and the backpack shouldering books probably contained the civil affairs handbooks, so that the Allied officer would know how to approach and face the liberated yet occupied Italian, as well as literature to turn him truly democratic and modern. 
This obviously poses the question to us how efficacious these handbooks truly were. After all, as said, little time remained between the OSS establishment, the issuance of the handbooks, and the invasion of Sicily to kickstart the Italian campaign. Without a doubt, the handbooks for the military government in Germany would provide more value later on. Get my point, if only alluded to in these brief remarks here, is that the handbooks in a way established an image in the Allied officers' minds that the occupation of Italy would go rather smoothly. After all, the childlike qualities of the Italian lower classes, especially found in southern Italy, would make them perfect pupils to learn from the British and US Americans. In this case, it should perhaps not go unnoticed that despite the scholarly esteem many of those working in later years in the research and analysis branch of the OSS had a cascading image of development in mind. In what amounts to a fine irony, I first came across these handbooks in the Hoover Institution's archives in Stanford, where they are stored as part of the um, Daniel Lerner collection. The sociologist obviously would later rise to fame as one of the chief proponents of modernization theory. It was this kind of thinking that informed the Allied approach. The encounter with Italy and its inhabitants as a society which surely was at a lower stage of development and for which the USA could only serve as a reference point. The OSS handbooks, as shown here, only superficially, obviously, by example, seem to subscribe to such ideas and instill the belief in the Allied civil affairs officers that with a little smile, interactions with the occupied people would go smoothly and no problems could be expected, given that the Italians would lack agency to lament their situation anyway. This mindset fostered especially the view of the planners of the occupation of Italy or the instruction at the military government schools. schools. Factual data or reliable interpretation of the information collected, as the OSS would lay claim to as intelligence agency, was mostly lacking and often gave way to wild generalizations that would make an impression on the Allies and cause many a deceiving misunderstanding of situations encountered in Italy. Then again, and, and with that, I'm, I'm coming to, to close my talk. One should also not make the mistake to overstate the impact of the OSS handbooks on the daily practices of the Allied civil affairs officers. The handbooks lost much of their value only two weeks after the invasion of Sicily, when the fascist regime collapsed and the consequences thereof presented the Allies with a whole new situation. Even more important, the civil affairs officers quickly came to realize that the information and notions conveyed by the handbooks and the scene encountered in the field in Italy did not correspond all too well. Likewise, OSS agents were sometimes astonished when they recognized an agency of the Italians, especially when they cooperated with partisan formations in central and northern Italy. On the other hand, it only seemed to underpin the non-existent will to act in southern Italy. The ideal typical scenarios provided by the handbooks could not withstand the confrontation with the local experiences gained in Italy, in, in other words. U.S. novelist John Hersey illustrated this perfectly in his widely acclaimed novel about the occupation of Sicily, which is called A Bell for Edano, which appeared already in early 1944. The novel's main prot uh, protagonist tears apart the notes he took during the lecture, and from the reading of the handbooks, as one of his very first actions after he had entered the Sicilian village he was tasked to administer. These notes also refer to a practical problems as many officers complained in a questionnaire issued by the MGOT that the handbooks would simply be too heavy and take up too much storage space, problems of no little importance if looked at from a point of logistics and moving swiftly in battlefields. The handbooks ra rarely assumed their role, I would argue, in assisting civil affairs officers on the scene. And even if one assumes that the civil affairs officers had taken note of and even studied all of the handbooks, the question still remained of how this information could be translated into an occupation policy and practice. Worse, they seem to wrongly calibrate the lenses of those administering the occupation, as the soldier Ray Ward revealed when he confronted his reading of the handbooks with the situation he faced in Italy. So we expected a land of opera, singers, saints, violent menfolk, and gangsters living in a land of plentiful with food, wine, and ruins of antiquity. And we were to see plenty of ruins in Sicily, but they were not the historic kind. 
The second sentence, of course, refers to the rupture with the expectations Ward had upon encountering Italy. This rupture came from many civil affairs officers since the handbooks were oftentimes illustrations of circulating stereotypes, imaginations, and ideal typical scenarios. It is not difficult to imagine how all this brought a situation about which was not at all the idyllic encounter between the Allied occupiers and Italian civilians as a glorifying post-war historiography has, had made believe. But that would be the fabric of, of another story. What is important here, and with that I would like to, to close, is in what ways this little foray into the handbooks produced by the OSS raises the question of the relevance of the information of the handbooks for the decision-making process of allied actors, be it OSS agents or civil affairs officers. Thank you.